it was like a summer time, you know. Mm. It was really I enjoy staying okay. in Paris. So yeah, for tonight it's online. So but I think it would be a pleasure for Yad to invite you <laughs> soon Thanks once so again <clears throat> for a seminar or workshop. Um, my team from the hat, someone could confirm to me that is um, going to save this video. Yes, it's me. It's me. So we are already uh, uh, live on the hat's Facebook. Okay. For you to know, you tell me whenever you want to begin, um, Marta and Albert. Yeah. So, okay, and, mm -hmm. but yeah, this was uh, Marco Gonzalez, the director of Yad and Unum, and he will later say some words for the introduction mm -hmm. thank you so yeah. much i we actually are friends on facebook yes. <laughs> yeah. we are yes. I also, yeah i also follow your activity professional i, I follow you too <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much yeah facebook connecting people yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's a great tool but yeah well so you tell me whenever you want to mm -hmm to start. Okay, so I think that yes, maybe. Yeah. Okay. Um, ready, Albert? Yes. Okay, so let me do a short um, introduction. So um, thank you, merci, and gracias to all of you for have taken the time to join us this evening. Uh, my name is Marco Gonzalez, and I am the general director of Jihad in UNUM organization founded by Father Patrick de Bois in 2004. Among the more than 7,000 eyewitness testimonies that we have recorded in the last 17 years, many of these witnesses have shared how a great many Jewish and Roma women faced additional suffering by being tortured and raped in the hours and sometimes days prior to being killed in these mass executions. Years later, we began to investigate the atrocities suffered by the indigenous communities in Guatemala, those who had suffered at the hands of the military dictatorship during the 1980s. Once again, we discovered that women were at the front line of mass violence. Today, we are working with the Yazidi survivors of ISIS in Iraq. Most of these survivors are women. And you cannot begin to imagine the graphic testimonies of violence and abuse that they have shared with us. And once again, it does not matter if it happened 80 years ago or if it is happening today. Through our research and field work, we know that women are usually the first victim each time a mass crime or genocide is committed. It does not matter that you were not a Jew or a Roma in Eastern Europe or a Kuche woman in Guatemala or a Yazidi woman in Iraq. You will know better understand the need to acknowledge and recognize the treatment of women during and after mass violence or genocide. Our intent is to give them all a voice in the name of all those women who perished, as well as those who survived. Many times women are thought to be unintended collateral damage only. We have to be conscious that for the sake of the next generations, so that we can learn from the events of the Holocaust and be ever vigilant today. We must be the boys that will raise against the anti-Semitism and recognize violence that is growing in our society and around the world. Today is the International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women. And tonight we are we hear about the research that Dr. Marta Havrishko has done about the sexual violence against women during World War II and the Holocaust. My colleague Albert Hitri will introduce Dr. Havrishko. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marco. So uh, it's my great honor to introduce you today uh, on the International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women to Dr. Avrishko. Dr. Mata Avrishko holds a PhD in history from the Ivan Franco National University of Lviv. Uh, she is currently a research associate at the Department of Contemporary History of the first Kripyakevich Institute of Ukrainian Studies of the National Academy of Science of Ukraine. Her research interests are primarily focused on sexual violence during World War II and the Holocaust, women's history, feminism, and nationalism. Her recent uh, publications include the book 
Overcoming Silence, Women's War Stories, uh, written in 2018, as well as articles such as Women's Bodies as Battlefield, Sexual Violence During Soviet Counterinsurgency in Western Ukraine. Dr. Rischko is a senior fellow at the Center for Holocaust Studies, Leibniz Institute for Contemporary History Research. Her research has been supported by the German Academic Exchange Service, Yad and Unum, Monash University, the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies, St. Gallen University, uh, United uh, States Holocaust Memorial Museum, and Yad Vashem, among others. Uh, thank you very much, Marta, for your presentation today. Um, the stage is yours. <laughs> thank you so much, Albert. Um, hello, everyone. I'm delighted to be here with you today. And thank you, all of you who make a room, make a time to join our discussion. I'm very privileged to have a talk today at the International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women. The history of World War II and other wars prove that women and girls became the primary targets of sexual violence during conflicts. The acceptance of women as objects during the war and genocide is related to patriarchal cultural norms and to the different ethnic, religious, and cultural identities women have. The idea of women as the barriers of community, family honor also contribute to this. In my presentation, I will show how sexual violence during the Holocaust in Ukraine became one of the horrors of everyday life of many Jewish women, as well as men who became secondary victims in the incidents of sexual violence because they witnessed this violence, they stayed helpless, helplessly, they couldn't help their women. Their masculinity was undermined. They felt less men uh, at those situations. In the last few decades, numerous studies investigated sexuality and sexual violence during the World War II and the Holocaust. Most of the studies follow German, Hungarian, or Romanian per perpetrators on the Eastern Front, including Ukraine. The role of locals in Nazi-occupied territories in the sexual victimization of Jewish women and some men during World War II and the Holocaust remains under-researched and its occurrence in, um, is underestimated. Yes, yet the scholarly attention to this group of perpetrators will help us to understand why and how former next door neighbors, classmates, business partners, friends, acquaintances, and even relatives turned into brutal sex offenders and how Jewish women and girls experienced th this violence as well as how experienced their families, their beloved ones, and the Jewish community in general. My presentation will focus on the role of sexual victimization of Jewish women during the Shoah in Ukraine, perpetrated precisely by locals who were Nazi helpers. I choose this group of perpetrators because they played a huge role in the Nazi genocidal policy in the East. As stated by Martin Dean, without the collaboration of indigenous forces, it would undoubtedly have been more difficult for Germans to implement their plans. Tens of thousands of locals in Ukraine were involved in so-called final solution of Jewish questions. A special role in this belonged to police forces. Local policemen rounded up Jews for deportation to death camps, ghettos, and mass executions on the outskirts of cities and villages, reported Jews in hiding, or detained them, and detained them. The guarded forced labor camps for Jews, patrolled the ghettos, shoot at Jews trying to escape, and then participated in the liquidation of the ghettos. Some policemen shot Jews while convoying at killing sites and or those in hiding. As policemen, they were not allowed actually to rape Jews, but the reality was different. 
and some of the policemen abused their position of power for their personal interests. The first incidents of sexual violence against Jewish women and girls, which involved local perpetrators, were at the beginning of German Soviet war in July 1941 during the wave of pogroms, primarily in Western Ukraine. As John Paul Himka pointed out, one of the characteristic features of the pogroms was the maltreatment and humiliation of Jewish women that stripped victims of their dignity and social standing. Women were shot, kicked, beaten in the face and elsewhere with sticks and tools, pulled by the hair and tossed from one pogromist to another. Some were chased through the street. Pregnant women were hit or kicked in the stomach. Women were primary targets of sexual violence, including forced undressing and parade before crowds, attacks on genitals and reproductive organs. Rape was part of a broader strategy of this ethnic violence of attack on Jews. The cases of rape are known from Lviv, Ternopil, Starybushnivets, Rafalivka, and other localities. Some of the young women who were publicly sexually humiliated committed suicide after the humiliation. And here you see the quote from the testimony of Rosa Moskowitz. She described the a suicide of her close friends. Uh, and she talked that uh, the crowd coached her and her hair was cut off and she naked, was forced to run down the streets naked. And then she committed suicide. Further genocidal policy created by Germans and their allies in occupied Ukraine but put local policemen in the position of power over Jews. And many policemen, according to Jewish testimonies, first of all, enjoyed their power a lot, used and abused it for private purposes. Elizabeth Wood argued that opportunistic rape by military men armed actors in war is a rape carried out for private individual reasons, not group of obje objectives. This type of rape is not planned, is not sanctioned, and is carried out mainly in secrecy. In other words, this type of rape is not spectacular or performative violence, and motivation for it is sexual gratification, for example, or exercising of power, and mainly exercising of power. As Helga Amesberger stressed, this type of individual violence is possible because of the existence of structural violence against Jews created by Nazi regime. As Kirsty Chetwood pointed out, rape during the Holocaust is a byproduct of the humanization process of genocide. Some policemen capitalized on the chaos and anarchy that accompanies war, especially in small villages where locals, not Germans, represented the face of new order. One of the witnesses of World War II in his native village, Yurova, in Zhytomyrsk was recalled that he was a young boy at the beginning of the war when he, with his friends, witnessed a brutal rape of young Jewish girl in front of her mother and father. The crime was perpetrated by policemen from the surrounding villages. And he stressed in his testimony, and then all the police, there were no Germans at that time. Many cases of opportunistic rapes also occurred in the ghettos and camps. For example, many local policemen were involved in garden ghettos. Some forced women to have sex in exchange for medicine, clothing, better housing, or permission to go beyond the fence and find some food. According to Jewish survivor Clara, that was the case in Kamenetspodolsk, Kamenetspodilsk ghetto guardian Ivan Tchaikovsky. She recalled, hungry women agreed to have sex with Tchaikovsky just to be allowed to go 
to buy some provisions at the market. They, there were many cases and all the ghetto residents were aware of it. Tchaikovsky raped ghetto residents, Tanya, Hanka, Donya, and many other women. After that, they would came to my mother and me to cry and talk about it. Some cases of opportunistic rape security during the forced marches from one place to another. 13 years old Raisa back in 1941 from Nova Pavlivka in Odessa Oblast was raped by her school friend Yakiv Hrabovsky. He was one of the policemen who guarded a group of Jews that was moving to Bohdanovka camp. Her parents asked Hrabovsky to help them to escape. He agreed at, uh, and at first he let Raisa's parents to go. And then he promised to accompany her to the house where her parents were already hiding. But he brutally raped Raisa in their way. Many cases of opportunistic rape occurred in hiding. Dania Bromberg recalled that in August 1942, in the village of Cernica in Rivne Oblast in, uh, in Volynia, she was caught by policeman Karilo Fedorov, who started leading her towards the police station. The girl tried to bribe him. Bribe him. Fedorov did not take her men's shirt, but he demanded sexual services in addition. Genya pointed out, he offered me, if you don't have sex with me, I'll kill you. Fearing that Fedorov would shoot me right away, I was forced to have sex with him. After Fedorov used me, he took me to police station, to police officer Polyhovich apartment, apartment where she was hiding for a while. Even when women agreed to use their bodies as a survival tool, they couldn't stand the humiliation. The prominent in this regard is the story of Rina. Here you see her with her mother, Berta. The photo was taken during the war. A young Jewish girl, she was a young Jewish girl from Lviv, and she was pretending to be a Polish girl, a Christian. But one couple man knew her real identity and began to threaten her. He demanded a sexual favor for the silence, and she agreed to that. But during the rape in Vysokoy Zamok High Castle, she shot him using his oven gun. Not all Jewish women survived the meeting with their former neighbors. This is the case of Hanka. She was hiding in the woods near Rafalivka in Volyn, and one day her fellow villager, a villager uh, um, back then a policeman, Arsenki Panasiuk, discovered her. Hanka was asking him, was asking him, let me go to the to the woods, Senka. I'll give you a gold watch. But Panasiuk raped her and kill, killed her after that. In addition, he took her gold watch. After a while, a Ukraine girl Natalia, who was a friend of Hanka and Arsenki, saw that watch at Arsenti home. However, he denied everything during the Soviet investigation, even the fact that he knew Hanka. It appears that it was not the watch that was the reason for Panasuk killing his fellow villager, despite the fact she had been begging for mercy. Her murder had to conceal rape, not the robbery. Most likely it was a spontaneous decision without any preliminary plan and was facilitated by the circumstances of impunity and non-accountability. Ukraine policemen, as we know, were charged with patrolling villages without Germans, uh, without German supervision, and they were empowered to kill persons whom German leaders defined as enemies of the said Reich mostly Jews. Therefore, the delegated right to murder has become a de facto and unofficial right to rape, which could and would be concealed by 
murder. Some forms of rape during the Holocaust have other means than opportunistic rape. This form of rape, Elizabeth Wood called rape as a practice. During the Holocaust, rape as a practice was usually intended to get information from women, was used as a mean, uh, means of humiliation, intimidation, and torture. Such sexual violence was usually tolerated by the senior management, especially when it comes to higher rank policemen who enjoyed the trust from the occupying officials. This is exactly the case of Dmitro Zhuk, the head of Rad Radivka police in what time. The Chernomorska Komuna newspaper that came out on 16 July 1944 had an article about him. Uh, and uh, in this article, the author of this article put the names of three rape victims of Dmitro Zhuk and his subordinates. During the Soviet investigation, he was asked about the rape of Helena Yusum and her sisters. He denied the involvement in the rape, but at the same time acknowledged the involvement of other policemen, stating that they could do anything they wanted because Romanians allowed them. The tolerance of occupying authorities or sex crimes of their local helpers played a crucial role in their violent behavior. It's obvious in the case of one of the supervisors in the Rozhanivka forced camp, labor camp near Tlusta in Ternopil Oblast. Most, most of the survivors of this uh, labor camp testified to the Soviets in 1945 about his sexual exploitation of Jewish girls stating that everyone knows it. There were cases when Jan Kiyanka, it was his name, summoned the Jewish girl and raped them. In summer, for example, Manya Rosenzweig stated, in summer 1943, he put one Jewish girl on the wagon and took her to the forest. It's very interesting that uh, this Manya actually was uh, herself the rape victim of uh, uh, Kiyanka, but she never admitted this during the Soviet investigation because she was ashamed to talk about this openly. That's why she chose the strategy to talk about other uh, women, about other um, uh, women's sufferings. Another, uh, another Holocaust survivor from Rozhanovka stated, he, Kiyanka, systematically humiliated, humiliated Jews, beat and raped Jewish girls. There was a girl named Salka, and Kiyanka summoned her three times, but she refused to go to him. Finally, she was forced to go to Kiyanka and spend the night with him, and she turned in tears. Another other uh, Holocaust survivor, Tsilia, also talked about sexual violence violence and she listed names of three rape victims, three young women, Jewish women, who were humiliated sexually by Kiyanka. It's very interesting. When I was looking at this topic of Rozhanovka, forced labor, I, um, uh, I found many uh, testimonies of Holocaust survivors uh, recorded by Shoah Foundation. And one of the survivor, Freda, actually uh, acknowledged that uh, sexual violence was a serial in the Rozhanovka. And she stated that she was at that time too young. She was only nine years old uh, during the war, nine, ten years old. So she was fortunate, like she said. And she described that there was a Jewish man, actually, the member of Judenrat, who was trying to mm. protect those, uh, those young girls. Um, Paula... Marta, uh, sorry for interrupting you. Uh, just a question. Um, we see only your first um, slide of the PowerPoint. Uh, did you change it or? Uh, yes, I'm changing it. Ah. Oh. It seems blocked. I'm so sorry to interrupt you. Oh, but uh, 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 now it's now it's changed. 
Uh, okay. M maybe you can um, Do just... you see? Yes, oh. now I see. Maybe you can just um, uh, make the um, uh, maybe play. Maybe I will stop the demonstration of uh, my screen and we'll... Um... I think you just can, uh, has to, do, um, you didn't was in the presentation mode. I think you just have to start the presentation mode. Um, like on, on the bottom, next to the 80%, uh, uh, you I'm just have to click on it. You see uh, on the right. <laughs> I'm sorry. Not so boring. should I, uh, Albert, should I stop my uh, PowerPoint no, presentation? No, you, you just have to click on on the bottom of your window you see where it's written 80 percent uh okay 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 let me on the on the right <clears throat> on the bottom there is written like the number 80 percent and just on the left there's a small symbol and when you click on it you play <clears throat> uh, hoo, 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 hoo. do you see my uh, other uh, slides oh, no. no it's very interesting it's the first time when i experienced okay. some um these technical issues so let me uh, let me okay let me share my screen one more time uh, now i'm opening my presentation um yeah no yeah okay and when you go, like you're not in the presentation mode, you're just in the uh, work mode. Uh, okay, yes. So, so when you have to start the presentation mode <clears throat> of the PowerPoint. Um, okay, this one, yes? No? Uh, it's... I can't see the cursor, so uh, it's normally on the right, um, on the bottom of the window, there is next to the number 80%, there is a small symbol. And when you click on it, it starts. Okay. <laughs> so sorry to interrupt uh, you. No worries, but uh. I actually, uh, um, I don't see how to fix it. I'm very stressed by this because mm -hmm. it's the first time I okay. never. Don't don't <laughs> worry. Problems. Oh, I think um, we are we are all uh, really. But it's very busy because actually yeah. I have uh, almost uh, twenty eight slides yes. and a lot of information actually yeah. here. And the pictures of perpetrators actually <laughs> their faces. Yeah. So it's very important to yeah. me for um, to to demonstrate it. Mm. Um. So just when you're with the cursor, go on the right. Uh, Albert. Yes. Uh, maybe, may I send the presentation to you? Yes, you can send it to me and I can yes. play it. Yeah, no I'm problem. sorry, but uh, yeah, maybe uh, we will try to do. Yes, yes because it's it's very important for me to, to show this. Uh, yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, because a lot of, uh, of information actually mm. is... Um, on the slides and the many photos of uh, Holocaust survivors mm. who testified about the experience mm. and the photos of actually those who mm. were charged by Soviets mm. with uh, the sex crimes. Oh, I'm sorry. It's don't worry. Uh, <clears throat> um, it's uh, so passionate listening to your presentation, so I uh, didn't want to interrupt you. I wasn't <laughs> sure if you're uh, but, going on. Yeah, with I'm, I am grateful that you um, told me about this because it's it's very, very unusual for me, actually. It's the first time when uh, when I had these problems. Maybe I will, okay. I will send it to you and you will um, All right. use it. Yeah, you will um, enable. Uh... Oh, it's too heavy. <laughs> Maybe I will use the transfer. No, no or um, yes. if, I think with, if you, you cannot do it also. Um, 
you just can uh, play it on your computer, but you, has, you have to start the presentation mode. Um, yes, I understand, but... Um... Okay, let me try once again. I'm so sorry for this, yeah. <sighs> and now just start the presentation mode. But the presentation mode mode is like you 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 have it uh, on the right on the bottom. <laughs> Can you see really on the right on the bottom the eighty yes. percent? Yes, yes, that's. Do you see my presentation now? No. no. No, we don't see it. No. Yeah, there's some problems. I started actually the presentation mode. Okay, I should uh, no. I should uh, um, transfer it to you. Okay. Is the best solution. Okay. Because... Or if or if not, like you can have it open like this, and you just. Um... Ah, so in this working mode, yes. Yes, it's also okay. So we can see it, and the okay. screen is fine. So it's it's no okay. problem. So uh, do you see the next slide about pogroms in summer? Yes, and yes, we see it. Okay, okay. great. Okay. So uh, let me please quickly just show you those uh, those pictures. Okay. So um, uh, um, here you see the testimony uh, of Rosa Moskovitz actually, um, and she described the suicide of her uh, of her friend. And um, uh, uh, this is the quote from the uh, about the forced prostitution in the communist Buddhist ghetto, and uh, um, the case of Yakiv Hrabovsky actually, who raped his school friend uh, Raisa when she was 13 years old, is very was is very interesting case. I told about this during my presentation. And uh, later on, I will uh, discuss uh, discuss it more uh, because it's very interesting case because Soviets actually didn't believe her, and the uh, uh, final in indictment and final judgment didn't include the charges with the rape uh, in Hrabovsky uh, in regard with Hrabovsky. And here you see the picture of this uh, Rina. Uh, she also was, uh, she pretended to be, as I told, a Polish a Christian girl, and she shot her abuser during, uh, during the um, sexual attack. And this is the, the picture of Arsenti Panasuk. And this photo actually was taken during the second Soviet investigation. As you know, the Soviets, it was the popular, let's say, the common practice in the Soviet Union, in the Soviet Union, when some Nazi collaborators were put on trial after immediately after the war and then in 60s and 70s. And actually, the Arsenki Panasuk was one of those men who was put on trial twice. And only in the second trial, we have this testimony of Christian girl, uh, Natalia. She was 18 years old. She was the same age as Hanka, who was raped and shot dead by Arsenti Panasuk. And she witnessed this rape uh, because it was near her uh, field. And here you see this uh, this uh, Chernomorska Komuna and uh, uh, the article about this Dmitro Zhuk. It's very prominent case how Soviets in instrumentalized the suffering of Jewish women in political purpose. Uh, because, you know, th this very prominent, the name, the title of the article, and the, in many cases, to my knowledge, as show, uh, as my research show, that High profile, uh, high profile officers, um, high profile perpetrators were more likely charged with sex crimes during the Soviet war crimes trials than, uh, than low rank officers. And I stopped my, uh, my, uh, my uh, story when I talk about Kiyanka, Jan Kiyanka. And here you see the photo from his criminal case from 1945. He was a serial, actually, rapist in this Rozhanovka labor camp in Ternobyl Oblast. And many Holocaust survivors testified about his sex crimes. 
And actually, it's interesting that, uh, and here is the, uh, the other uh, Holocaust survivor who was a uh, young girl in Rozhanovka, but she also remember the sexual attacks on Jewish young girls perpetrated by Kiyanka. And on this photo, you see another Holocaust survivor of Rozhanovka labor camp, uh, Petya. Uh, like she, uh, uh, as she recalled her name during this time. She, uh, on this photo, she's standing on the center. You can see her. And she described one day he, Kiyanka, came over to me and said he was to sleep in my room. And, I, uh, and she actually um, uh, didn't understand this proposal. So uh, she spent the night in the bedroom of uh, her acquaintances, but uh, in the morning, the Kiyanka threatened uh, to kill her, and his fiancé, actually, Bronya, she was also a Jewish girl at that time, uh, told uh, Petya to go out for, uh, uh, to, uh, to run away and to hide in the uh, house of her uh, cousin. He was a, a Jewish policeman at that time in this Rozhanuka labor camp. And she remember that for the three, for three consecutive days, she was afraid to go out from uh, the house of her brother. brother. And then uh, she was, uh, she escaped from uh, this, um, from this Rozhanovka labor camp um, with the help of three local Gentile women. Uh, so, um, now I wanted to uh, uh, to tell that many uh, cases of serial rapes were committed by a group of policemen, mostly at night and very often uh, under the influence of alcohol. Volodymyr Pakelis, Jewish inhabitant of a forced labor camp, in Lysahora in Berdychi recalled that despite his old age, uh, 46 years old camp guard commander Trochim Piskuno Beremsky was sexually exploiting Jewish girls, Sonia, Fira, Klava, Raya, who were about 18, 20 years old. As for the psychological state of rape victims, according to the, um, uh, to the testimony of Volodymyr Pekelis, they stated that, that they had rather to be shot dead faster, so they can't stand this constant and serial humiliation at that time. Sexual violence was a widespread phenomenon in the Genichesk prison in Kherson's uh, Oblast. From available sources, we could reveal at least four names of Jewish rape victims. One of them, Rosa, was only 13 years old. Other victims openly told the maid in the police cleaning lady uh, that uh, they wanted to commit suicide to avoid further suffering from rape. The main perpetrator uh, in Genichesk prison was the chief of the police, Volksdeutscher Andrei Falkenstern, and his several deputies, including Alexander Nastashenko. You can see their photos on the screen. Those police commanders were known to rape women in their subordinates' presence. Also, they often involve their subordinates in the rapes. They, uh, they essentially control the repertoire, targeting, and frequency of sexual violence in their police units. They made sexual violence a legitimate everyday practice of their service. In the eyes of policemen, rapists, rape was an acceptable, even a routine exercise of male superiority and aggression. Um, another case, uh, um, I want to stress that, as you can notice, the high-profile perpetrator in Genichesk had a German ethnic origin. 
My research shows that some Volksdeutschers enjoyed high uh, credibility among German supervisors. And that factor influenced their sexually violent behavior. This was the case also in the Jewish colony in Neileben near Krivoy Rih, where the starosta of this, uh, 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 of this uh, Jewish colony, Dachno, also was a Volksdeutscher. And he was himself an initiator and the leader of multiply sex attacks on local Jewish women. In his initiative, in 1942, 16 girls were chosen for the work at the final stage of the killing of local Jews. On German orders, the remaining Jews from May 11 at that time were made to register, and then they were taken to Krivirich, where they were killed. With the German uh, permission, Dachno initiated selection of those girls from 16 to 30 years old. And those girls were put in two buildings. And four Holocaust survivors, four Jewish women, testified during Soviet investigation that almost more than three weeks they were uh, um, raped and beaten by those local perpetrators, including Mikhail Lipa. Uh, his photo you can see on the slide. Actually, what is interesting about Mikhail Lipa, he was only one among this huge group of local perpetrators who acknowledged the rape and described all the details of sexual attacks on Jews uh, in Neleban. What is noticeable about many of those serial rapists is that they occupied high-level positions in the system of auxiliary, uh, auxiliary police. They also have good relationship with Germans and Romanians. They often have joint celebrations with their super, um, supervisors and their family knew each other. And during those celebrations, they could openly talk about rapes of Jewish women. They didn't hide this despite the fact that it was a criminal offense. They made numerous rape joke, jokes in order to impress other men, re reinforce masculine values and demonstrate their hostility to the enemies of the Reich. In many cases, sex crimes against Jewish women uh, were perpetrated by locals and, Ger uh, and German and Romanian uh, at the same time. So different groups of perpetrators were involved. Testimony of Vera Shetnikova from Stepan Ghetto vividly described the situation. She recalled at night, policemen would, would bring Germans and they would grab young women and rape them. They really brutalized them. They took the women away and then brought them back and left them half dead. In her testimonies, Manya from Trostyanets in Vinnesia Oblast highlights a constant rape fear and describes how she was hidden by her mother at one night when local policemen together with Romanians invaded, entered, uh, Jewish houses. They escape uh, uh, from, from the house and in this way she escaped actually rape attempt. Another Holocaust survivor, Dora, uh, Donia, recalled that they made a stop in um, uh, one of the uh, Machuha. It was uh, in their way to Pachora camp. This group of Jews was put in some barracks. And during night, the uh, parents of young girls started to hide them. We were put in, uh, uh, and she recalled, uh, Romanians and policemen, of course, found the girls and raped them. My friends, even distant relatives, were raped. One girl was also raped, even she got pregnant. 
And this, uh, this testimony is very important in this regard because she described one of the frequent uh, um, consequences of sexual violence, um, I mean in pregnant of those women. And we have testimonies when some women get, uh, got birth to, um, give birth to those children and then they uh, murdered them because they can't uh, live with uh, those uh, with those children, so we we see how uh, it was um, uh, uh, how it was really difficult for uh, for women to to bear this trauma in their uh, uh, in their daily life. Here you see the execution sites uh, on the outskirts of Bar in Vinnytsia Oblast. And here you see Clara. At the time of Soviet investigation in 1965, she was 39 years old woman. And here you see she's standing on the side where her family members were killed by Nazis and their uh, local helpers. At the time of mass killing of local Jews, uh, the uh, chief of the local police, Andrusiev, here you see him uh, during his show trial in Bar in 1966, uh, he was ordered by Germans to choose a group of young Jewish girls for entertainment. And um, more than 16 girls were chosen at that time and during at uh, during the celebration of mass killings of jews those girls were raped and then killed only clara survived and she testified during the soviet trial and she asked the soviets to execute the andrusiv and it was very uh, uh, it was a very prominent trial because Soviets actually ordered to make a psychological expertise. And this uh, medical uh, uh, expertise actually shows uh, that uh, Clara could suffer a huge trauma after the rape and after the witnessing of mass killings. Despite the fact that Andrusi was trying to put all blame on Germans, he was found guilty of complicity in the rape of 16 Jewish girls, in addition to charges with other war crimes and sentenced to death. In the case of Andrusiev, it's evident that he was even encouraged by German to rape a Jewish girl. He received the permission for this sexual offense. And what is interesting in this case, that he has the possibility not to rape Raisa, and nobody would found, uh, find out of this, because they were, Andrusio and Raisa, in a separate room, in private space. But he decided to take advantage of his position of power. Maybe his motivation is connected to the fear of being seen by Germans as not true men. The not reliable man who disrupt a military brotherhood, the not loyal soldier of of the Reich, of the Third Reich, who had the mercy to it, uh, to the enemies of the Reich. This social dy dynamic and social pressure may force men to participate in wartime rapes, even if in peaceful times they haven't sexually violent records. It is also evident that engaging the locals in sex crimes committed by Germans depended on their position of power in the policy structures and German personal attitude toward them. More trusted policemen were allowed to take part in those abusive practices. Andrusi was such a person. One of the chief of uh, one of the uh, chief German officer actually like, uh, uh, like him and call him great Germanophile. Germans expressed their gratitude to Andrusiv for his service by awarding him medals in times of war. And with the approach of the Red Army in 1944, they helped him to escape from Bar to Romania. 
there he changed his name to George and uh, uh, Andrew Hill and KGB had been looking for him since 1947 but had managed to find him only in 1962. In this context, the right to Ray Praisa was a form of, re of reward for Andrusiv's loyalty and service. Therefore, the case of Andrusiv serves as a testament to the fact that gang rape of Jewish women and girls, where both Germans and the local police were involved, was not just about sexual gratification and exercising power. Involving local policemen in sexual offenses served as a means for building links and social ties between different groups of perpetrators. I mean, high profile occupying authorities and their local subordinates. And I want to finish my presentation with the story of uh, Anna. She was a survivor from Tomas Polgetto. And she describes that one of the Ukraine policemen, Mikhailo, and they called him Moise because he spoke Hebrew very, very well, because he helped Jewish, uh, Jewish people a lot. And he spent a lot of times with Jews during his childhood. And he knew many Jews, local Jews, very well from Tomaspol. But at one night, he called Anna and two other young girls to go to Romanian soldiers on the pretext of cleaning work. But they understood that what is going on and what it will happen to them. So the Anna asked uh, uh, Moise to, uh, uh, to give her a second and she escaped. Moise entered her home and uh, required her to return to Romanian soldiers. And in this specific situation, we see the agency of local policemen. So the Moise had uh, uh, made a very clear decision not to force his friend Anna to, to go to Romanians. And it was the expression of agency. We know and uh, that this agency was limited by the, the whole system of violence and genocidal policy of Germans. But in many cases, local policemen had the choice not to rape or to rape, participate in raping or not to participate. And the story of Anna is very prominent in, in regard of consequences of sexual violence um, and she described, my husband was a military man and when he came home from work, knocked on the door and I immediately ran away, hit. It seemed to me that the Germans were knocking again. It was after the war. So she was, she, uh, at that time, she had a, uh, she had a, ch uh, a child, she had a husband, but she also, was a survivor, was a barrier actually of this sexual trauma because every sound at night was associated to her, was associated with the rapes, with the sexual violence perpetrated by Germans, their alias and local helper, helpers at the time of the Holocaust. So uh, today is the perfect day, uh, I think, to talk about the sexual victimization and sexual agency of Jewish women and girls during the Holocaust, during this um, black, dark time um, of uh, during the World War II. Thank you very much for your attention. I will be happy to respond to your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation and giving us insights of the um, yeah, fate of Jewish women during the uh, Nazi occupation of yeah, uh, Eastern Europe. I'm sure there will be some questions. Uh, maybe you can write them in the chat and so then we can uh, ask to Marta Vrishko the questions. 
and uh, yeah. And uh, yeah, once again, uh, excuse me for the interruption later because, but uh, we couldn't see your slides and uh, there were a lot of questions seeing your slides and um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes, I'm so sorry for that. Yeah. Don't worry, like, uh, <laughs> but uh, it was really passionate um, uh, presentation. So I, yeah, wouldn't, <laughs> I don't want to, to um, interrupt you. Yeah, yeah mm. but, but Thank you very much for bringing this to, to mm. my attention. Yeah, sure. it was very important. Yeah. Mm. So, okay. If there aren't any questions, um, I think... Uh, Albert, talk, yes? I, I would like perhaps to ask a question. Okay, sure. Marta. Go on. <laughs> so first of all, hi, Marta. Glad to see you in, <laughs> in Germany as well. And... Um, I uh, hope you're, you're doing well. So I'm interested in, in a particular topic. Um, of course, you know, I'm, I'm not only a historian, but a lawyer. And I know we know from um, research from our colleagues uh, that um, sometimes German soldiers had legal issues because of rapes. And the question was always how to treat it uh, by the German army. Um, what happened to the Ukrainian policemen? Did they have any problems with um, German justice during wartime or was it totally okay and tolerated by the Germans? Okay, thank you very much, uh, Andrei, for your question. It's a very good question. Uh, because uh, um, I, um, from the uh, testimonies and from the sources that I have, this attitude was uh, um, different in different cases. For example, uh, in one case, um, uh, in Zdolbuni, for example, one local policeman raped a Jewish girl in, in the city center, and, he, and uh, he was punished by sticks, 25 sticks by Germans, in the presence of, uh, uh, so it was public, uh, it was uh, um, publicly, um, uh, uh, public punishment. But uh, uh, also I have um, one, uh, one case when local policeman was executed actually, because a husband of raped woman reported him to Germans. And for Germans, it was the question of order actually, because uh, those rapes uh, started in, in uh, uh, this village, it was a Jewish colony in, in Olizarka near Rafalivka in Bolin Oblast. They started when the Soviet army just ran away and Germans didn't come yet. And they were, and they, um, they prolonged, let's say, these uh, sex uh, attacks on Jews. But when Germans came, they said, stop. Now we, are, we will decide who will be punished, who will be raped, or who will not. So this guy actually was executed by Germans as a punishment for rape of Jewish uh, women. But in other cases, as you see, even Volksdeutschers, you know, this Falkenstern for, from Genichai's prison, during Soviet investigation, uh, he told about Rassenschande, about the Nuremberg laws, about prohibition of sexual um, relation with Jews because he's uh, true German and so on. But uh, numerous testimonies, actually uh, 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 numerous um, um, uh, testimonies contain information about his involvement in uh, serial rapes. And it's obvious that Germans tolerate this. So uh, in different cases, the attitude was different. For them, it was actually important uh, to, um, it was uh, uh, in some cases, uh, as I told, it was uh, uh, some, um, some kind of reward you know, for, for their loyalty, for their service. And it was uh, during the Second World War, as you know, it was the idea that men could be effective 
in the front if they are sexually um, uh, sexually um, Satisfied. Uh, satisfied, yes. That's why we have military brothels, we have institutionalized sexual slavery in uh, the, the phenomenon uh, of comfort women, and so on and so on. We have the brothels in the how. Actually, I visited the how and saw this place where it was the brothel uh, for, uh, for, um, uh, for men. So th this idea was very common at that time, that men should have uh, sex that uh, to be effective, you know, to be effective and uh, to be to be loyal to the Germans and to be uh, willing uh, instruments of genocidal policy, especially in the East when it was very important, you know. So thank thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank it's you. Very interesting question. Yes. There are different questions we appear. Uh, one is asking uh, Hans Jones is asking. Um, thank you for, no, sorry, Paula Simon, thank you for your interesting presentation. You talk about Jewish women being victim of sexual violence. Did you find any cases of Roma women as victim of sexual, sexual violence? Okay, thank you very much. I, uh, at first, uh, my, uh, my attention was put on Jewish women and girls, but now, I understand that I should uh, uh, should include other groups of women, especially Roma uh, women and girls, and also Jewish men who were also humiliated and who uh, experienced rape and were uh, um, also engaged in forced prostitution, especially young boys, Jewish girl, uh, Jewish boys. So I will extend. Uh, uh, my research and will include the, uh, these uh, experiences of those groups uh, to my research. And I hope to, to describe their victimization and their sexual agency in my uh, book. Thank you so much. On our side, um, if you are interested, we have interviewed many uh, Roma, sorry, the TV is working. <laughs> And uh, we have interviewed uh, many Roma women who have been raped, um, uh, either uh, in Romania, what was called at the period uh, Transnistria. Transnistria. Mm -hmm. They have been raped by the folk Deutsch or by uh, the Romanian or by um, Ukrainian, but it was nearly every girl in every, every, girl in every family. And mm -hmm. so, um, um, mm -hmm. These testimonies are available. It's uh, testimonies of victims mainly mm -hmm, mm -hmm. who were survived and uh, explained that. There were also testimonies of women, yeah, Roma, who have been uh, raped in um, uh, Macedonia mm -hmm. by the Bulgarian. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and officially, nothing happened. So all these testimonies are accessible if you are interested. And, Thank you uh, so much. Mm -hmm. And another question is from Marco Gonzalez, our director. He said, why do you think the violence against women has been so long time a taboo for so many years? And was it easy for you to find the evidence in the archives? Mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, Marco, for this question. It's a very interesting question. So uh, many factors contributed to the silence. First of all, um, those women, because of patriarchal culture, because of cultural um, ideas about sexuality in general, many women were hesitant to talk about this op openly. Many women uh, saw that this is their private trauma. This is their private experience. and. Um, this is not belong to the meta narrative. This is not uh, this not fit to this meta narrative of the Holocaust, and uh, some uh, many of women actually were uh, uh, prefer to keep silence about this. Some of them were not willing to harm their relatives and their uh, and their friends, relatives, and especially their children. So they don't want to reveal this uh, painful information because we know the, the, the phenomenon of transgenerational trauma. And many scholars who work with sexual violence actually describe that when they hear the stories, when their grandmothers 
were sexually humiliated. They became a barrier of this sexual trauma. So we have this secondary traumatization of, um, of new generations. And uh, uh, another factor which contributed to the silence is the unwillingness of many researchers to talk about this question. Be um, and uh, this is obvious for me, even in my work. Some of my uh, fellows uh, hesitate to talk, to ask women and men about sexual violence. And um, as we know, that after the World War II, uh, Nuremberg trial neglected sex crimes. It was not included in the article Sex uh, Against Humanity. And we have uh, any case uh, uh, when Germans were charged with sex crimes. That's why many women, I think, uh, so they uh, they uh, couldn't fee, um, they, they um, couldn't see this support. And the gender factor, many lawyer, most of lawyer, lawyers, judges uh, were men. And uh, I study Soviet uh, crime, war crimes trials, it, and it's very obvious for me that women were uh, afraid and ashamed to talk with men about their sexual experience, you know, about their uh, sexual trauma. They prefer to talk with women, but women were not uh, present during this investigation. So we have a lot of factors that contributed to the silence, but we know the trials uh, to uh, Rwanda and uh, Yugoslavia, former Yugoslavia, uh, encouraged women to talk about this openly. But because for the first time in international law, the sexual violence was defined as a tool of war, as a tool of genocide. And many women understood our trauma matters, our sufferings matter, and we should to, uh, to raise uh, our voice and to speak out about what we experience it. Marta, I would like to add, um, I forgot also another testimony. It's from uh, an Ukrainian girl. Mm -hmm. uh, she was waving the German who arrived like that. And uh, the German, a German man um, took her in a farm and raped uh, her. She was very young and he, 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 fall, he fell asleep. And she took the flat and she took the rifle and she killed him. So the family was <clears throat> very afraid. They mm -hmm. tried, uh, um, they tried to hide the corpse, and they say we have to run away from the farm because the German will realize it missed once. And yes. uh, so from from where they were hidden, they were finally near the place of the shooting of the of the Jews. But she described uh, all the in details the rape, and she was not Jew and she was not Gypsy. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important also to, to investigate what happened to young girls in general, because I'm afraid that uh, many rapes happen also against local civilians uh, that nobody mentions in the story. Uh, actually, in, um, uh, thank you very much for your comment. Actually, in past years, I conducted more than 100 interviews uh, with local women in Western Ukraine who were members of Ukraine Nationals Underground or just witnesses of World War II. And they described a lot of cases when uh, Germans uh, 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 actually attacked local women and in one locality for example the uh, the sex crimes uh, were uh, um, not uh, uh, so uh, the the soldiers actually raped every almost every woman uh, in this uh, precise village during the week and their men um, um, made some bunkers for their women and uh, uh, were trying to hide them and feed them during this time. But you know, I, uh, I was impressed that after that, those women were afraid to be punished by Ukraine nationalists for not resisting and for not, you know, uh, because it was, uh, they were blamed uh, of uh, putting a shame on, on the Ukrainian nation, you know, uh, b because of that. Uh, so it's a very interesting case. But yes, we have uh, also the cases of uh, rapes of Slavic women and girls as well during the World War II. 
another question from Pasco. Paco. Paco is from Spain. He said a very interesting presentation and area that is difficult to handle. My question, would you say there is a close connection uh, between sexual violence and alcohol? Yes, definitely yes. Thank you so much. I recommend you to read a newly coming book of Edward Westerman, Drunk on Genocide, and he clearly states in this book that is clear distinction between alcohol and the sexual violence. And uh, from my sources, it's uh, very evident because many policemen became heavy drinkers during the war because many of them can't even perform their tasks during the Holocaust because they were forced to shoot children, you know? Um, that's why they became a heavy drinkers and their wives complained about this because they became not only heavy drinkers, but they became uh, uh, sex offenders, domestic abusers, and um, in many testimonies of Holocaust survivors, we see this statement, drunk policemen entered our barracks, drunk policemen entered our house. So it's, it's obvious that we have this connection of two to phenomena during the war. And I think that alcohol facilitate many war crimes in different localities, in different times. And Edward Westerman actually described it very well in his mm. uh, book. Mm. I got a question uh, uh, from Lance Jones, where the majority of the local policemen professionals have been policemen before the arrival of German, or they were appointed by the German. Uh, it's an interesting question. Uh, uh, many, uh, some, uh, one part of those policemen actually belong to the so-called militia or Ukrainian siege. It was a military formation, police-like formation, uh, with, which was organized by Ukrainians before the arrival of Germans. And some of them were drafted to this newly uh, Hilfs Polizei uh, formation. Many of them were, uh, some of them actually, were local guys, activists uh, of uh, communist parties, uh, members of uh, Kolkhoz, uh, and so on. Um, uh, and that's why it was one of the reasons why Soviets do not want to make show trials, many show trials, because this sensitive information about their communist past will be public, you know, and for them it was why we, uh, former communists became, you know, willing collaborators and traitors of the motherland. Uh, but, um, you know, many of those, of those men actually uh, had a very low education so three, uh, three grades, four grades, uh, and um, many of them were young, uh, young men um, from different villages. In ma many cases, they were locals because they knew very well where Jews are living. So they could point it out on uh, those Jews, you know, and uh, to, uh, to, um, um, to find out that where they, uh, they are hiding. So they, um, so they play a crucial role, I think, in, in this genocidal policy of Germans. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Marta. Thank you, Patrick. Um, for those of you who are interested in the lecture of um, Edward Westerman, we had him also invited here to our Behind Memory series uh, last year. So I put the link into the chat. So if you're interested, you can uh, watch uh, the video. Um, Andre, maybe do you want to say um, some conclusions? <clears throat> Andre? <laughs> oh. Andre? If, if Andre is not here, I can yeah. do it. Uh, for me, okay. the very, very important what you are doing because it's very untouched area. 
I will never forget I was in a in a farm uh, transformed in a museum in Romania and uh, where people have been shot and they put only portraits of male. And so I asked to the guide of the museum uh, what happened to the woman. He told me, oh, but she has been, they have been raped, but you know, it's not the same thing. And so, uh, in fact, nothing was said about what happened to the woman. And I, I think it's too much considered as a collateral damage of the genocide. And I think uh, your research are very, very upscale and go on. Uh, don't hesitate also to investigate about the sex slaves in the Gestapo because we yes. found many, many testimonies about the sex slaves who were mainly Jewish. Yes. And um, I, I think you must go on uh, and uh, you are very welcome to teach uh, in our places where we are teaching. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you for all of you for joining our discussion today. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great evening or a great day. Bye bye. Bye bye. And thank you to everyone. <laughs>